Hello, this is Lisa Lowe with Science of Rowing. I reviewed an article this month um, regarding female collegiate rower, just mostly general health and felt like it's a bigger conversation that I wanted to be able to pick the brains of some lovely, smart individuals. Um, so I will let them introduce themselves and then we can kind of dive into a little bit more nitty gritty of this article. So Sarah, if you want to go first, uh, or Christina. Name, I'll go first. My name is Christina um, Baker, and I am a clinical psychologist, and I've worked in the field of eating and weight disorders for many years, um, both uh, in a hospital academic setting, doing some research, and also in private practice. And um, I, ha I was a collegiate rower. I still row now. And um, I am involved with community rowing in Boston, um, and I see a lot of athletes in my practice. Um, I'll go next. So uh, my name is Emily Burgess. Um, I am a sports performance and eating disorder dietitian, uh, currently working for uh, Laura Morietti Nutrition. Um, I've been a dietitian for about five years now, working within the eating disorder space, um, initially residential treatment, um, and then kind of transitioned into sport between sports medicine clinics, um, collegiate programs, uh, tactical nutrition spaces, um, and we've worked with a lot of rowers um, through one-on-one -on -one counseling through the practice, um, primarily in the lightweight rowing space. And I am Sarah Adler. I am probably the newest dietitian at Laura Moretti's private practice. Um, so again, working in that eating disorder space, working with athletes, and we get quite a few of rowers in there. Um, but I'm also a dietitian at Exos, so I'm also at UCLA Health Sports Performance on top of the work that I do with Laura's practice, um, and also a former athlete. So not a rower, but um, I ran track and played field hockey in college. Awesome. Um, so yes, lots of lovely minds to kind of have a nice conversation here. Um, so Christina, I feel like you had some initial thoughts, uh, so we'll kind of let you kick it off. I did. Um, some, of the, some of the statistics that stood out for me from this article, um, the 25% of lightweight rowers reporting a history of an eating disorder. Um, I was a little surprised actually that only 12 to 15% of lightweight rowers reported disordered eating. Um, uh, I'm not sure how it was defined. I, I didn't get a chance to look at the actual questionnaire. That seems low to me, given my experience in the lightweight rowing world. Um, but I, the one thing that was very, you know, I think important takeaway is that uh, there weren't actually huge differences between the open weight and lightweight populations. And there's a variety of reasons why potentially they did the assessment in February and, and the lightweight rowers may not have been trying to make weight. Um, but that's notable and I think consistent with my experience that an open weight rowing programs, um, body image and eating and weight are still things we need to pay attention to. Um, and I'm trying to think what else, um, oh, that 71% had never worked with a nutritionist. That was super surprising to me. Um, and that a third of open weight rowers described that they limit their food fairly or very often. That's a pretty high amount of a third of the open weight college rowers describing restriction in the context of a program where they're probably burning thousands of calories a day. Yeah. And, and being big and strong is valued, so. Yeah, those were honestly, those were some of the statistics that really struck me too, that made me kind of want to have this conversation with you guys. Um, because I mean, in my personal experience in college, I know that those things were true amongst my teammates and myself periodically, probably, right? Just from like that culture of like, like female body image or like what you're supposed to eat or not and all those kinds of things. I feel like you don't get away from that. And just the fact that you're in like a power and endurance sport. Um, so I, I definitely found that those were... <laughs> Pretty, pretty interesting statistics. And even if the lightweight eating disorder aspect is potentially a little bit higher than what this reported, the fact that the open weights were, you know, reporting what they did, you know, just, just that's where this, this is a really nice conversation. Um, so I'd be curious, uh, Emily and Sarah, what you guys kind of work with and see in that way. Yeah, I think that, um, 
I think that sometimes with rowing, I think I've heard a lot of conversations from my experience about like hearing about power to weight ratio, right? So there still is an emphasis on understanding how your weight allows you to move in the boat, right? In regards to your power and strength. Um, so I can definitely, and I, in my experience as well, I've seen disordered eating just as prevalent within the lightweight, but also within the open weight community, just because of that conversation, obviously weight is a part of that sport, um, particularly in lightweight rowing. And it has to be part of the conversation and normalizing that conversation. Um, but I also think it's really interesting to kind of see that the struggles between both of these sports really is the same right in regards to figuring out how to feel their body properly figuring out really how to how their best feel um in their body within the sport as well yeah and just to play off of that i think there's this mental shift across the board maybe it's not just in rowing maybe it's in other sports where there's that like aesthetic leanness that that is highly valued right and it's that lighter is faster mentality and it's like well at what point is it detrimental to performance, right? Like maybe lighter isn't faster, maybe fueled is faster, maybe stronger is faster. And that's where working with a dietitian can be really, really helpful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so one of the things that whenever I hear these conversations and I read these articles, I think a lot about what is most important and what's driving these young people's behavior is what they value and the benefit they get from certain behaviors and the outcomes. And in thinking about, you know, these kids are, they're in 18 to 22 age range, they're balancing like independence, academics, romantic relationships, identity, rowing, performance, there's so much going on. And if we're just thinking, well, you know, they, they're they underweight, they, they're not fueling well, they've got these symptoms, we got to get them back on track, let's talk about performance and fueling. That's great, but that may not be the only value driving the behavior. So you may have someone who really cares about doing well at rowing, but is also really, really eager to have a romantic relationship for the first time and thinks that their body is a big part of that. And if we don't know that part of it, it's like it's hard to get them to motivate to change their behavior if we're not really understanding what they value. Um, you know, and so, and it, they can value lots of different things, but it may look complicated when you're a coach or you're a trainer, or someone working with an athlete thinking like, wait, don't you want to go fast? You're in a D1 program. Like, don't you want, you know, let's talk about fueling for performance. And they're like, yeah, that's great. And then they go back to their dorm and they're like, yeah, I have a date tonight. Or, you know, I really want to do well in my academics. And this makes me feel more in control to control my eating. Like, it's so complex if we don't know what they're valuing and what they're getting out of it. Out of, out of restricting or under fueling. For sure. And I'll kind of add on to that. I think that um, it's about with these collegiate programs, creating a culture where the athletes feel comfortable going to their captains, going to their coaches, going to their support staff to talk about those types of things, right? They are not just an athlete, but they're also a student and a human being that wants to have a full college experience, right? Um, and it's not just about how they're performing in the water. It's about how they're sleeping. How do they feel day to day? How are they doing in their classes? What are their relationships with their family, their friends, right? And creating a space within these programs where these conversations are normalized. And it's not just about how you perform at practice, how you perform on the water, but like really treating and supporting the entire person. And that the athlete identity piece in this article was so interesting. I'd never seen that there's a scale to yeah. measure that because yeah. you know when there's a vacation or a time off summer or whatever or there's an injury that that you know what is going to make you feel like you have a sense of accomplishment if you've lost the athlete Pete not lost it but you can't kind of activate that on a daily basis and your yeah. eating is gives people a sense of accomplishment losing weight gives them a sense of accomplishment as sad as that is um and so that the idea of the athlete identity and sorry you just made me think of it Emily and the idea of like it's really important for them to have more more sources of self-esteem than just the rowing even though that may be their primary source of self-esteem um just build, building that in. And one last thing, and then I'll stop talking, is the, <laughs> the coach piece is so complicated to me at the D1 mm. super intense rowing programs. I'm not sure it's easy for the coach to be in that role as the, 
as the person that you go to with vulnerability, um, even though it would be wonderful if those communications can happen, that is a hard balance for the coach in a sport where toughness and grit is like what you're looking for. So I thought about where can athletes get support and what can coaches offer if they're not necessarily going to be the person coaches can go, I mean, kids can go to if they're worried about something. You mentioned Emily um, senior, like captains, having senior mentors, which they do at my daughter's program, um, making sure that the coaches um, can point kids in a, in towards resources that are going to be useful towards nutrition resources or have webinars that the coaches don't go to, um, which we arranged um, at my daughter's program. Okay, sorry. No, I think, and I think that's part of the challenge, right? Is that it, as a coach, you might recognize that pieces of this conversation are really important to keep your athletes healthy and on the water, but it is, it, it's a very interesting barrier and, and you maybe don't actually want to cross that barrier because then it gets just really messy and complicated, right? But I think that's a really, really nice point of coaches prioritizing, providing resources, whether it's, you know, on-campus counseling or, you know, through the athletic training room, maybe they have connections to nutrition or dietitian, you know, like having those resources like laid out of like, I expect you to use these if you need them. Um, I feel like is a very different and nice way to sort of set up like, I'm here to, <laughs> to assess you as a rower, but to be your best rower, you need to have all these things taken care of. Um, you know, and I don't think it matters if it's a D1, two or three program. I think rowing itself you know, even if you think at the elite level after college, or even some of the stuff that carries over into like club rowing, right? It's, it's really similar coach to athlete relationships. And I think establishing for men or women, right, that, that support system, I think is everybody to everybody's advantage. Um, but. Yeah, I totally agree. I think there needs to be a safety net there that's in place for the mental health of the athletes. Um, coaches can't do it all. So I've always been a huge proponent of there being some sort of beginning of the year assessment where coaches know signs and symptoms, um, comments to identify from athletes where they're like, okay, that's red flag goes up. Here's the safety net. Here are the professionals that I can send them to, to make sure that they're being supported in that way. Yeah, it's a, it's a funny space. Uh, cause you, you, the coach, when you're in college, or at a club, they can be such a important, almost parental figure. Um, and you kind of want to connect with them, but then you're also worried about, are they not going to boat me if they hear that I haven't been sleeping well? Like, it's just really tricky. Um, it's a, it's a challenging relationship. And I do think that coaches should be empowered and encouraged to at least reach out to a youth who, an athlete who they see some of the red flags and just ask and let them know that they're observing, you know, you look, you've looked more tired recently. Um, is anything going on that we could offer some resources to help support you? So just, it doesn't, they don't have to get into it necessarily, but just pointing it out at least, and then um, encouraging them to talk to the captains or whatever channel they think, you know, could provide the athlete with some support. And I like the idea of a beginning of the year assessment. I know the lightweight programs tend to do that. Not all of them, but some, but I don't know that the open weight programs. A lot of it, I feel like depends on what the, what the athletic training staff decides they want to do. I feel like that's typically where it's a little bit more driven from, but then that's also like another, you know, I feel like the athletic training room is sort of a separate from coach safe space for athletes to be willing to talk a little bit more about these outside of rowing aspects, whether it's the school stress, the relationship things, the lack of sleep, the family life stress, the this, that, the other, that kind of pile on and then either drive kind of, as you all were saying before, some of the like controlling your eating behaviors more, or even the, you know, exercise more kind of control balance stuff that can kind of come in too. Um, so I feel like, I, I do feel like pre-screening stuff is usually a little more driven by athletic training rooms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree with that, that the training space and college is often a really great safe resource. Sorry, go ahead, Emily. No, I think I, one thing I just wanted to add about, like, I think that the, a sports RD within a collegiate setting has a really great and really cool role of being able to be 
in the boathouse, for example, and being around the athletes and being around the coaches, but then also kind of being that person that bridges the gap between the sports facilities and health services, right? Mm-hmm. Trying to normalize that conversation and make, not making them feel like if they have to go see a psychologist or a dietitian within health services or within sports med, that it's not a reason to pull them, right? I think there's sometimes this fear that if they have to go see a counselor or they have to go work with a dietitian on something in particular, that immediately they're gonna get pulled and really trying to bridge that gap and create that space of comfort, right? And I always think about it as like, okay, if you're in a, a really tough class in college and you have to go seek academic advising or tutoring, there's no negative side to that, right? It's you're ad- advocating for yourself, you're getting additional support. And I think that that conversation also needs to translate in the sports side as well. I think that's a really nice way to think about it and look at it. Um, Cause you're right, like you wouldn't, nobody would say anything if you're like, oh, I went for extra help. You went for, you know, office hours, you went for tutoring. Um, but to have, to have that conversation with somebody who knows more about fueling, like, man, I wish I did that in college, <laughs> you know, like that would have made me so much faster and healthier, you know, um, definitely. Like, I feel like when I was in college, at least like all these aspects of stuff, right. Nobody was like super, super thinking about it in the performance lens. Um, and I feel like that's a really nice shift that's starting to happen that, um, you know, really to have your nutritional intake in order, your mental health in order, your recovery tactics, all of those kinds of things, you know, it's, it's a piece of the performance now and not just the, oh, there's something wrong with you. You've broken down and you need help with this. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, perfect. I don't know. I'm sorry, I was going to say, I'm, I don't know if you guys have noticed that in your conversations with clients over the past even like five years, that like their their baseline knowledge is maybe different, or um, if you're noticing that trend with the clients that you work with, or if you feel like it's sort of still just like introducing and building. I think that the the idea of fueling right before and right after appropriately is radically changed in the past 15 years in that that like the the boathouse they have snacks there they have milk in the in the locker room um at my daughter's college like and like my son's like it's and my athletes my young athletes when we talk about where should you add something where could you add something um the post-workout snack that never used to be on the meal plan necessarily and now it's like that's probably one of the most important places when you're talking about performance, right? Is the re- replenishing afterwards. I think that's come up a lot more in the past decade. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would agree. I think that there's definitely, um, and speaking to my experience in the collegiate space, I think there's a lot more resources being thrown in to those bookends, right? Really making sure that they are feeling appropriately right before and also after. Um, but I think a big thing about what Sarah and I really work with athletes on is that it's, I think that that's a really important component, but really looking at the bigger picture of like, are you actually taking your care of yourself every single day throughout the day between classes, when you wake up in the morning before bed and really looking at the bigger picture, because yeah, you can be, you can have a snack before training and you might feel really good in that moment. But if the overall energy balance isn't there, that's kind of where more of the conversation sometimes needs to lie. Agreed. I also think like on the other side of it too, like athletes are realizing what is not supposed to happen in training, right? Like there is now this conversation around losing that menstrual cycle. I remember when I was in college, that was like, you would hear, which is awful, right? Like, oh, you're fit. Right. And now it is okay. There are detrimental psychological effects of losing the cycle. There are detrimental performance effects of losing the cycle. And I think that's a conversation to be had now in that collegiate setting. Yeah, that's something that, um, you know, because I'm like in my early 30s, right? So it's within my age group, athlete, like any athlete I've spoken with, any female athlete I've spoken with, and the way that loss of your menstrual cycle was managed, you know, like whether it was in high school or college or whatever, compared to like the information that we have now, it's just so, so different. Um, And it's so wonderful to to have so much more knowledge to be able to share with these young women, because I mean, I know I've always been somebody who struggled with that. And 
thinking back on my number of injuries, my mental health, my, you know, just overall energy levels, all this stuff. Like when you think back, right. You're like, Holy cow. Like, I wonder why I didn't have a regular period. Um, and no wonder why I had, you know, a shoulder injury or a knee injury or this or that or whatever all the time. Um, and it's when, when female athletes come into clinic for me, it's becoming more and more often. And if not, I want to make it hundred percent of the time that I just ask them that question of like, Hey, do you have a regular menstrual cycle? Do you know that that's a training <coughs> tool that you need to maintain that? And if you don't, then that's where, you know, seeking some assistance of a nutritionist, dietitian, you know, making sure you're recovering, like all those things. I think it's just such a, it's like, to me, a very exciting, different conversation that we're starting to have now. And it's fun to hear that you guys are hearing it too. Um, Cause yeah, I don't know. It's, it's crazy to think back on either clients I've seen and the injuries that they've sustained and then finding out that they don't have a regular menstrual cycle and being like, aha, no wonder, you know, and, and just how much you can learn so much younger about how important that is. Um, I think, and how much more knowledge we have, it's just, it's super, super cool. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like it's, it's turning into sort of a different world for female athletes than we've had. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And just kind of helping them understand that. Like, I think that I've heard this before of like your menstrual cycle is kind of like your superpower, right? Having that is, going to allow you to be the best athlete that you can be right in regards to recovery in regards to performance. Um, and I think that the conversations around that are continuing to, are starting to happen in the collegiate space and really normalizing that. And I think one fun thing that we did, um, back when I worked in the collegiate space was we did like menstrual Monday and like really kind of normalizing the conversation. Like we're going to talk about periods for like 45 minutes. We're going to throw out ideas. We're really going to like normalize the conversation. We had ATs in there. We had docs in there. We had coaches in there just to really be able to just make it a normal conversation that you don't need to be hiding it. You don't need to be um, like withholding that information. Right. Um, so I think that's kind of a fun, kind of a fun way that we kind of were able to start that conversation and really try to kind of make it casual banter in a sense, right? Yeah, I think we've made a lot of progress in terms of what we talk to them about. I think where I find the struggle is how do you use, how do you motivate them towards what we know is the healthy behavior? Because yeah, it's, it, it, you, they can know, I was just working with a lightweight athlete yesterday. Um, and she knows she just lost her period again, hasn't had it for two months. And, and it's like, I know I need to get it back. I know that means I'm a stronger athlete. Um, but her behavior, she can't quite get her, the eating disorder behavior to align with that. So that goes back to what I was talking about aligning with values where, you know, the knowledge is, definitely increased and the conversations are there, but with people who are vulnerable, it's still more than just knowledge. It's like, how do you motivate them to, you know, kind of buy into the value of what, what they know, but it's competing demands of like the desire to lose weight and be thin can be so strong. Um, that even if they know it, uh, that they, and want it, it's still hard to act on it sometimes. Mm -hmm. That continues. We have not found the magic solution for that. <laughs> yeah, takes a lot. Takes a lot of work for that, for sure. It does. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I really like the idea, Lisa, of you in the PT space and in the training space. That's where people often feel comfortable going. You know, for as a first line, because there's no stigma of any kind, and so. Um, it's a great place for you to, to assess risk factors and then offer resources. And if yeah. we were talking about weighing at visits, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. do you weigh people at an, at a, you know, at a PT visit and uh, Lisa and I or had this with strength and conditioning or yeah. Right. With, right. Yeah. With mm -hmm. training it. And, and the idea of like, it's not necessarily a bad thing to have um, a weight just be one more data point, like your heart rate or how much you've slept over the past week. If you can kind of normalize weight, so then desensitize people to it, 
um, sometimes that can be helpful. And that's in family-based therapy for eating disorders, a weekly way is a standard procedure for desensitization. And thinking about your menstrual period as being one more just standard data point. You check in every month. Did you get right. your period? Right. Yeah, I think I, I totally hear what you're saying. And I think that one, I think that having normalizing the conversation about weight definitely is important of like, it's going to be part of the conversation in the rowing world, particularly with lightweight, right. And understanding that that is a part of the sport. Um, but what I found really helpful is creating a space. If we are going to be doing weights every month or around um, like her test, for example, is really talking to the athletes about like, you have the option to not look at the weight, to turn around on the scale. So I can be the person who's gonna help and guide you and to monitor this, but it doesn't need to be a part of your day, right? Cause I think that sometimes I remember like weighing some girls in before an ERG piece to get the power to weight ratio and all that kind of information. And I could just see in their face that their mood just drastically changed after they stepped off and they had to go do, they had to go pull a 6K, right? Yeah. So really thinking about the power of that number in certain situations. And I think that always giving them the option to be like, no, I'm good right now. Definitely. I understand that you need to take it. It's definitely part of the conversation, but I think for my mental health right now, I kind of want to maybe not know, or we can talk about it at a later time. Yeah. It's very, it's there's, it, Lisa and I were talking about this. Like there's no actual data on what the best procedure is and weighing people, not weighing people. For some people, it's so helpful because they get the feedback of what they're doing with their behavior. And for other people, it's just derailing and they just, hmm. it's just not helpful. So it's, yeah, it really varies. I also think that coaches can use that information well or not well. And there was one situation a few years ago where I don't think there was any bad intention, but the, the weight and the weight to ratio stuff was on a spreadsheet that all the athletes had access to. And that was really unhelpful um, because it became very competitive um, individually and it just became really not a helpful situation. So having that, I, I had a, a, a child who had a very a low weight, a, a good ratio of you know, weight to power. And so I was always like, oh, great. Yeah, weigh her, that's helpful for her. You know, that, was, that was useful for her. She didn't necessarily need to know the weight. So, but using that, the weight to power ratio is useful. Um, but if you are listing it out so that the kids can see everybody else on the team's weight and ratio, that just seems um, like a challenging situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think also having like having uh, nutrition departments or policies in place within athletics about who has access to that information, right? Mm -hmm. um, I always kind of think about it as like if coaches want weights and want these numbers. I'm like, okay, so how, how, how would having these numbers change the way that you train these girls? Right. Is it, most of the time it's not, right? It's really not going to make or break anything in regards to their training plan. So I think also having those policies in place can really help protect the athletes in regards to like what you're saying about them looking at each other's weights. They don't need to know each other's weights or having coaches being able to view everybody's weights and really having more of the medical staff be monitoring those numbers and giving them what only what they really need to know in regards to that performance piece. I'm curious what um, Sarah and Emily, what you'd seen or heard from lightweight athletes. I know there's with the lightweight um, kind of uh, policy guidelines that came out a couple of years ago from US Rowing. I think they were mostly geared at uh, under 18, if I remember correctly, but um, some of some of the lightweight programs changed their policies around uh, doing an assessment in September of what your blind weight is. So just you get called by the athletic department, you go, you can't dehydrate, you get a blind weight. And if you're above a certain level, they say you can't row that season. Have you heard about that? Yeah. So like if you just at, to protect them from uh, like they, they would have to row open weight if they want to row, they wouldn't be yes. able to be a lightweight. Yeah. Um, so basically saying it's not, we don't think it's safe for you to be sitting at 142 and have to get to 133 or whatever it is for head of the Charles. That seems like in six weeks for you to get, that's not safe. So we're going to pull you from the season. Have mm -hmm. you heard of that happening? Cause I've, I've, that I've heard about that at least at one school. And, um, that was an interesting new thing that started a couple of years ago there. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that those conversations uh, I've definitely had about is this the best fit for you, right? For your body, for your health. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, most lightweight rowers that I work with, we're not sitting close to race weight most of the year, right? We are fine tuning six to eight weeks out of a race to make sure that they're getting down to the weight that they need. But for their height, most of the time, they can't be sitting there from a bone health perspective, mental health perspective. So I definitely think that those conversations are um, something that we've had to have. Um, but I also think that for someone who has rode lightweight rowing their whole life and then stepping on the scale and saying all of a sudden that they can't row, that can be really upsetting without having a bigger conversation. So um, just, yeah. I thought it was kind of interesting that it was a policy. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's where I feel like they are for the like U17 and U19 groups, right? That's more of where they, I feel like are starting to enact like less lightweight categories too, um, to just, to make it, I feel like similar to what you're saying, sort of to make it like bodies that sort of naturally hang at that weight and let it be acceptable, but not, not encourage the cutting behaviors when it's still a growing, maturing athlete. Um, it feels like that's a shift that I've noticed too. Um, but I hadn't heard of what you were talking about, Christina. It's kind of an interesting concept. I don't mind it. To me, that sounds super smart. That was like, you know, it's like- little, It would be a little bit like if, you know, uh, coaches used a growth chart, got the childhood growth chart and said, you know, when they're young, you know, in high school, like lightweight rowing might be pretty hard for you because it looks like your body's gonna, you know- uh, kind of looks like you'd sit at this percentile, which would have you around 145 and losing 15 pounds a lot of, during the year might be hard. Um, and, you know, the, using that information just preventatively. Um, yeah, it's a neat idea. I also think about like the athlete mindset though. You tell a kid that maybe this isn't the best fit for them. And then all of a sudden there's that like, um, you know, pursuit of excellence or like, I can do that, like over adherence almost, um, which is also a slippery slope. So I don't know if there's like a good answer there. Right. But just kind of thinking about it that way. Um, but the timing piece certainly is interesting. Em and I were talking about, um, timing of cuts and, and all of this yesterday, actually. And, you know, if we're further out, you think about three months of under fueling is essentially potentially like three months of poor performance, right? So um, the seasonality and the timing of it is definitely interesting. It's tricky. Yeah. yeah, it's very hard. It's a very, it's a very tricky aspect of the sport, but it was, um, you know, as we said in the beginning of this conversation, also very, very interesting from the fueling restriction, like feelings and all that kind of stuff that, you know, keeping open weights in our minds of, of flags of all this stuff, I feel like is, it's also, especially, you know, you think about all the many, many pressures when you're in college, especially with how social media is now and all that kind of stuff. Um, I can, I can 100% see where open weights and light weights are sort of similarly susceptible to a lot of what we've talked about. And that, you know, just that extreme, more extreme, like need to hit a certain weight on a certain day at a certain moment aspect of being a lightweight just makes it that much more, you know, complicated. Um, I think you point out something important though, which is that it's very visible and it's on people's radar in the lightweight world and less so in the open weight um, world. And, and I hear a lot of young people say that no one would believe them that they had an eating disorder if they're not skinny, right? So yeah. you can have all kinds of disordered eating and distress and be at a normal weight or above weight. And, um, you know, people often feel uncomfortable coming forward because they feel like, well, I don't, I can't really have a real eating disorder if I'm not underweight. Um, so there could be a lot hidden in the open weight um, environment. Yeah. Yeah. I think, and I think that the stats in this paper showed that, you know, that yeah. like yeah. the people that were filling out these surveys were, felt comfortable disclosing in that moment. Right. Yeah. And it really shows that they, the, the pop, it's, it's very similar, right. In regards yeah. to within, within both um, sports. Yeah. Um, Definitely. And also if you feel like you're, you're having, um, like you, you are trying to improve and get into a, a higher boat and you're thinking, you know, you're out there on the water, you're doing what you can there, but you're not kind of having the success you want. You might think, well, what else can I work on? 
um, and maybe changing their power ratio, there's something like, well, maybe the coach would appreciate that. Um, it can be just another way to try to increase performance. Of course, you know, the right. catch that you're actually probably harming your yeah. performance. That's where, um, with, with all the thoughts of sort of like under fueling versus proper fueling for training, I keep, I'm sure you guys have seen the New Zealand um, team's tactics leading into Tokyo. Um, their dietitians essentially like required their athletes to eat appropriately and lightweights and open weights. They flat, they like checked all their female athletes for regular menstrual cycles. And then essentially like very tailored each individual person's eating. Um, and they all ate a, a ton more. And if you look at the medals they won at Tokyo, like they flew, you know what I mean? They like, they killed it. And it's because they were all well-fueled. You know, so it's, there's speed in that and there's so much more health in that. And I feel like that's the piece of like, you know, conversations like this professionals, like you all, you know, it's, it's resources for coaches to utilize and to set up for their teams so that, you know, we can all just keep everybody a lot healthier, but I think we're going to get kicked out soon. So I want to say thank you for all of your lovely thoughts. And I hope this was fun for you guys. Um, and definitely a conversation to continue. But um, thanks yeah. for organizing, Lisa.